This is video 10 in our series on tensor calculus. In this video, I'm going to follow up our last two videos with some examples of what covariant basis vectors look like. In the last video, we developed this definition for the covariant basis vectors. We said that they're the set of partial derivatives of our position vector with respect to each of our coordinate variables. Well, one of my complaints about some of the literature that's out there today is that they throw these formulas at you, give you a few rules for them, and expect you to understand how to use them. Well, what I want to do today is to take a few minutes to illustrate what these things actually look like in real life. That'll give you a much better appreciation of what you have and how to use them. So to do that, let's recall something that we discovered back in video number eight. In video 8, we discovered this, that if we have some curve through space that is defined by some parameter t, and then we take the derivative of our position vector with respect to our parameter t, what we're going to get is a vector that, first of all, is tangent to the curve, which means it would be tangent like this. And the length of this tangent vector is going to be equal to ds dt. Now, if our parameter here is s, the actual arc length of the curve, then ds ds is just 1, which means we're going to have a unit vector. So we get a unit vector if our parameter is the arc length. But in general, the length of this tangent vector is equal to ds dt. Well, now imagine that we have some two-dimensional space. And I've illustrated it here with a point and a couple of coordinate lines, the one for z1 and the one for z2. Well, uh, what are these coordinate lines? Let's uh, remind ourselves of what this means. A coordinate line for z1 is that line that is mapped out when we hold all of the coordinates constant except for z1. So whatever the value of z2 is here at this point, we hold that fixed as we vary z1 and that will map out this line right here. And likewise, if we hold z1 constant and vary z2, then we'll map out this line right here. So think of it this way. This line right here is the same as a line like this that is parameterized by a variable z1 when everything else is held constant. Therefore, when we're taking the partial derivative of our position vector, with respect to z1, we're treating this as a function of z1 only. So that being the case, this operates exactly like this case. It's just that our parameter on this line is z1 instead of t. Well, that means that the partial derivative of our position vector with respect to z1 is, first of all, going to be tangent to the curve, which means it's got to be tangent to our coordinate line right here. And secondly, the length of this tangent vector has got to be equal to ds dz1. OK, we make the same argument for z2. If we hold z1 constant, vary our value of z2, we're going to map out this line. And then it's going to look like a curve that is parameterized by z2 only. And when we take its partial derivative, we're going to get a tangent vector that's tangent to that coordinate line down here. And its length is going to be equal to ds dz2. Well, the extension of this idea to higher dimensions is quite obvious. First of all, the partial derivative with respect to zi in every case is going to be tangent to each coordinate line. And secondly, the length of each of our basis vectors is going to be equal to ds dzi. Now, what we're going to discover is that almost all of the basis vectors we run into are going to fit into one of two special categories. So let's take the information we've discovered here about basis vectors in general and see how it applies to each of those special cases. Well, the first special case is this, that our coordinate line is a straight line. So uh, imagine, for example, affine coordinates in which we have a coordinate line being a straight line and the coordinate uh, variable is u here. Well, what does that mean? First of all, uh, 
our covariate basis vector's got to be tangent to the coordinate line, well, that's only one possibility. The only way you can have a line that's tangent to a straight line is if that line is itself along the coordinate line. So our basis vector has got to be parallel to our coordinate line in this case. And the other part of this is that the length of it is equal to ds dz1. Well, our variable here is u. And if you remember in affine coordinates, our Euclidean distance s is equal to the scaling factor times our coordinate value u. So what is ds du? Well, ds du is simply equal to a. So in the case where our coordinate line is a straight line, then our basis vector is going to lie along that straight line, and it's going to have a length that is equal to the scaling factor of that particular dimension. All right, well, the other special case is the one in which our coordinate line is a circle. For example, something like this that we might encounter in plane polar coordinates. Here, if we vary the variable theta while holding all the other variables constant, this uh, position vector is going to sweep out a circle. So what does it mean for our basis vector in this case? Well, number one, our basis vector has got to be tangent to the curve, and that means it's got to lie here. It's got to be tangent to the circle which means, of course, it is perpendicular to the vector itself. Well, what about the length? Well, how does the arc length of our circle relate to the variable theta? Well, the arc length along a circle is simply equal to the radius of the circle times theta. Theta is in radians, and the arc length is equal to the radians times the radius of the circle. So what is ds d theta? ds d theta is simply equal to r. So the length of our basis vector in this case is going to be equal to the radius of the circle. And that's always the case when our coordinate line is a circle. All right, with uh, each of those two special cases in mind, let's go over to the graphing software and see what the basis vectors look like for each of our sample coordinate systems. Here we have affine coordinates, and um, I have set the skew angle to 60 degrees, and uh, both scaling factors are equal to 1, so the, the uh, coordinate units and the Euclidean units are the same. They're both equal to 1, and you can see how we move the point around. Okay, now look at this first. As I, uh, I put the point on one of these coordinate lines, as I move to the right, notice that the value of z2 doesn't change, only z1 is changing. So that means that if we're going to find the covariant basis vector for z1, it's going to lie tangent to this line. It's going to lie along this line. Well, uh, same is true for z2. I'll move along this line. z2 changes, but z1 doesn't. Therefore, our basis vector here is going to lie along this line. And since the Scaling factors are both 1, then the covariant basis vectors are going to be unit vectors, and they'll look just like this. So here's the z1 basis vector to the right, and z2 uh, uh, skewed upward like that. Okay, next let's illustrate the idea of a linear combination. In order to do that, we'll drop a vector in place like this. And to see the linear combination, we also need to include segments like this. OK, now uh, look at the z1 basis vector. And then this scalar value on the opposite side, v1, is the length from this point to this point. So if we multiply the scalar 3.3 times this basis vector, we'll get a vector that extends out to this point. Likewise, if we take our z2 basis vector, multiply by 3.5, we'll get a vector that extends up to this point. Now, if we add this vector and that vector, we've created a linear combination, which is just the vector we started with.
So our vector v is equal to 3.3 .3 times z1 plus 3.5 times z2. It's a linear combination. OK, now um, watch what happens when I change the scaling factor for z1. I'm going to change the scaling factor for z1 from 1 to 2. And watch what happens in our diagram. OK, here you notice uh, several things happen. First of all, the grid lines uh, for z1 got twice as far apart because our coordinate units are now two um, uh, Euclidean units. Each Euclidean unit is half of the, the, the coordinate unit. So the a coordinate value here for our point is 2, but the Euclidean distance is 4 from there to this point. Well, it also had the effect of cutting the scalar value for V1 in half. That was 3.3, now it's 1.6. But at the same time, it doubled the length of our Z1 covariant basis vector. So the product of V1 times this basis vector results in exactly the same component vector down here. And therefore, although the scaling factor changed, the point didn't move, nor did the vector change in any way. We simply changed the value of the components of our vector because of the scaling value, but uh, it didn't change the actual invariant value for the vector that we're illustrating here. OK, last point here is um, let me set the um, scaling factor back to 1, and I'll also change the skew angle to 90 degrees. OK, now having done that, of course, what we've done is to change our affine coordinates back to being orthonormal. The axes are right angles, and the uh, scaling factors are 1. So what we have here is just the Cartesian coordinate system. And as we move this around, you'll recognize that z1 and z2, these basis vectors, are nothing more than x hat and y hat that we're already familiar uh, working with. So the Cartesian coordinate system becomes a special case of our generalized method of establishing these basis vectors. All right, let's look at plain polar coordinates. Here we have our coordinates of r, which measures the distance from the origin, and theta, which is the angle from the polar axis. OK, now if I move r, if I change r without changing theta, I'm going to be moving on one of these grid lines outward like this. That means that we expect our covariant basis vector to be in a direct line for this segment with r pointing out in this direction. And since I have the scaling factor set to 1, we'll expect that uh, covariant basis vector, the z1 basis vector, to be a unit vector pointing in this direction. Now, for theta, if I hold r constant and change theta, I'll be moving around the circle like this. And that's the second of the two special cases we talked about before, meaning that um, the z2 basis vector is going to be parallel um, excuse me, it's going to be tangent to this circle, pointing out here, and the length of it is going to be equal to r. So this is what the basis vectors look like in plane polar coordinates. Now, uh, notice uh, to our latter point about the length of z2, notice as I move outward, the length of our z2 basis vector gets longer depending on where I am on the diagram. Z1 remains a unit vector, but Z2 changes length based on how far we are from the origin. Notice also, of course, that as I change the point, the direction of these basis vectors changes as well. So the, the point of this is that um, in affine coordinates, these basis vectors were fixed. They were the same everywhere. But that's not true for curvilinear coordinates. And that's why we put them in the diagram right on point P and not on the origin itself. The uh, length and direction of these things very much depends on where we're evaluating them. And that's why they're associated with the point. 
Okay, now let's um, illustrate the linear combination. And to do that, I will throw in a vector like this. And I will include segments like this. Okay, you should be able to see this pretty easily. The linear combination is going to be 3.2 times z1, giving us this vector plus 0 0.4 times z2, giving us a vector out to here. Then added together, they give us our vector. So v is equal to 3.2 times z1 plus 0 0.4 times z2. Now, watch carefully as I move the point around. I've set this up as a constant vector field, so this vector is the same everywhere in space. As I move it around, notice the vector points in the same direction and has the same length no matter where I spin it around. But the components change very much, change drastically. And the reason the components change is because even though the vector is constant, the basis vectors are not. They depend on where we are, therefore the linear combination looks different depending on where I am in the space. So um, unlike affine coordinates where we can slide it around anywhere and have the same linear combination values, that's not true generally for curvilinear coordinates. Okay, so I, uh, oh, one other thing. Let's change the scaling factor here. I'll change the R scale to two and watch what happens. Similar to what happened with affine coordinates, the uh, component values change, the length of the basis vector changes, but the vector doesn't change, nor does the point. The so same idea there is with affine coordinates. Okay, that's plane polar coordinates then. All right, let's take a real quick look at cylindrical polar coordinates. You'll remember that our coordinates are our rho, this distance, phi with this angle, and z with this distance. And you'll also remember that um, if we held rho constant, it'll map out a cylinder like this. And while we're right here, let me add this path as well. This um, is the circle that our point will sweep out if we held rho constant, if we only change the angle phi. Okay, so um, what do our basis vectors look like? Well, if we're going to hold everything constant but rho, then we expect our basis vector to be an extension of this line that rho is uh, generated here, this segment. And indeed, it, it looks like this. It's a unit vector because we don't have any scaling factor here. Okay, and then because um, our coordinate line for phi is this circle, we're going to expect z2 to be a vector that's tangent to this circle, and the length is going to be equal to the radius of this circle. And indeed, that will look like this. And finally, since z is um, changes in the direction simply vertically, then um, that covariant basis vector is going to look like this. And so here are the the various uh, covariant basis vectors in cylindrical polar coordinates. Notice as I move closer and further away, the length of z2 changes, but the length of z1 and z3 don't. They're both unit vectors. Okay, I'm not going to go through the illustration of a linear combination. I think you can f imagine what that would look like. And finally, we'll look at spherical polar coordinates. You'll remember the coordinates are r, which is the distance from the origin, the angle theta, which is this angle right here, and the angle phi, which is this angle. You'll remember that it gets its name because if we held r constant, it'll map out a sphere like this. So while I'm here, let me also indicate the path that uh, will be taken if we held everything constant but theta, then our point will sweep out this circle. So that becomes our coordinate line for theta.
And then we'll do the same thing for phi, which is a circle going around the axis in this direction. Okay, so what do our basis vectors look like? Well, if we held everything constant but r, then we expect to move along this line, and we're simply going to get a uh, vector that is an extension of that line as a unit vector like this. And then because theta increases as it goes downward like this, we expect the basis vector z2 to point downward but be tangent to this big great circle here. So indeed that will look like this. And the length of this vector is equal to the radius of this circle, which is r. And finally, uh, if we hold everything constant except for phi, we'll be sweeping around in this circle, which means that z3 is going to be tangent to that circle, pointing out in this direction, because that's the direction that phi changes. And it will look like this. Now, this vector, the length of this vector, is the radius of the circle, which in this case is r sine theta. It's not r, it's uh, r sine theta. So you can see as we move the point around that vectors z2 and z3 change in length as we move the position, but vector z1 does not. It remains a unit vector. Okay, I will let you use your own imagination to imagine what a linear combination would look like, and I'm sure you can do that. With that, we'll wrap it up, and hopefully these illustrations give you a clear understanding of what covariant basis vectors are all about.